my name is Mary Ujita and I'm a curator at the Museum of London and I'm really excited to be here today with you for this very special event when we're going to be delving into the history of London through the eyes of Toto the Ninja Cat and her most recent adventures in The Mystery Jewel Thief which is now available in paperback but first I'd like to welcome TV and radio presenter and children's author of the Toto Ninja Cat series Dermot O'Leary. Hello Dermot. Hello Mary, how are you? I'm oh, good, thank you. It's wonderful for you to be here. It's, thanks for, it's lovely to see you again and thanks for inviting me. Um, I had the best time when I came to see the museum and it, I can't, and it helped me incredibly, immensely with the, with the research and, and so forth of the book. So thanks a million for having me. Oh, it was fantastic to be able to show you around. So do you want to give us a little bit of an insight into the latest Toto adventure without giving it all away? <laughs> so this is my fourth book about my cat, uh, Toto the Ninja Cat. Uh, she is, she's a real cat and she is our, uh, her and her brother Silver are our cats from Italy. Now Silver sadly passed away a few years ago. He died quite, did, died quite young, but we still have Toto and we have her adopted brother from, uh, from Battersea called Sox. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always loved doing uh, the books for many reasons, but I always loved, when I was growing up, I always loved fictionalised versions of London, particularly Edwardian and Victorian London and wartime London. And, um, and so part of me writing the books is like a love letter and a homage to the, that kind of era of London, I suppose. Um, and so I, I wanted to um, base something. I kind of had an idea just sort of noodling around about uh, the animal crown jewels because now I'm on the fourth book. I've sort of tried to create a whole world where animals coexist with us, but we just think they're pets and they're wild foxes or whatever outside. But actually uh, they've got their own lives. They've got their own, they go to gigs. Uh, they've got their own police force. They have their own government. All, the, all this happens under our noses, but because we're so fixated with our worlds, we never look down at them. So they have their own crown jewels. And, um, and in this book, I so I had this idea of, and I couldn't quite formulate it about how the animal crown jewels are kind of slightly magical and they go missing. And then Toto and her boss, well, her boss, Larry, who's the, the, the head of the ancient order of international ninja cats, who is an actual cat. He's the 10 Downing Street cat that Larry is chief mouse. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's a real, he's a real life cat. I've not met him. I actually wrote to someone at 10 Downing Street. I met them at uh, the Pride of Britain Awards. And, um, and I wrote, we spoke afterwards and they said, and. I was going to go down and meet Larry and see where he lives, and uh, and I think lockdown happened, so I didn't quite, it didn't quite work out, but uh, or an election happened, one or the other, and um, but I remember she I remember her writing to me and she said just to let you know Larry is like the least friendly cat in the world, he's just so <laughs> aloof, so I thought that's even more perfect. So he's kind of the uh, the ancient the, the boss of the ancient ninja cats. He's kind of like the Q, I suppose, if you're mm -hmm. if we're using a kind of James Bond analogy, and then Toto is his deputy. Um, but I like the idea of the crown jewels going missing. Larry gets framed for the crime and um, Toto has to prove his innocence, A, and B, find the crown jewels and reclaim them. Oh, it's very, very exciting. I really enjoy reading it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my cat got involved as well. He sat next to me while I read it. So <laughs> good solidarity there. <laughs> cats anything like my cat. Uh, it's only when you start to need to make a list or do some writing or, or type an email, then they suddenly are really interested in the desk and then sitting immediately in front of you. Yeah, and chewing your pen when you're trying to write. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's so, so there's a lot of um, historical references in the book. So would you mind saying a bit about that and what inspired you to include those in, in the yeah, book? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've sort of tried to do it with all of the books, to be honest with you. So the first book, um, the cats go around quite a lot of London landmarks, but I just kind of touched on that really. And there's a kind of subterranean rat town called Ratbra, which is um, about 20 metres under where we live in Camden, sort of Primrose Hill way. So that's where that's the, 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 cap, the, the capital of, of, of rats, North London. Um, and in the second book, uh, I love kind of old time, I love old maritime kind of history and iconography and all of that. So I set it in kind of um, down in the London docks that I just put in Greenwich nominally because obviously the, you know, all the docks are sort of further out now. Um, and that was about a, a shipment of cheese that was that had gone missing and, and, uh, and Toto had to find it because it was a, 
it was for the politicians. It was on the eve of an ancient, uh, of a, a very important um, peace conference. And without without the cheese board, um, you know, peace was was jeopardised, and every piece of cheese in the UK had gone missing. And then there's a there's a lovely old pub. I sort of I I, I based the sour saucer, which is this old rat um, old cat and uh, rat milk bar, which is where the animals go for drinks because they obviously they've got no interest in alcohol, so they drink milk, and um, and the sour saucer I based on the Blackfriars Bridge, and the sour saucer was kind of like a a prospect of Whitby style pub, you know, those kind of old fashioned pubs on the on the Thames. And um, I, I, I based the sour saucer around a pub where all the old ships, rats and ships, cats used to go and drink milk. And if they could drink a sour saucer of milk and keep it down without throwing up, it, it meant that they were they, they it meant that they wouldn't get seasick so it meant they were worthy cats so then but if not they had to walk the plank and then you end up in the Thames and so I, I've, based, I've just finished book five and I've based a scene in the sour saucer as well so London history has always been kind of uh, part and parcel of something that I've loved and when I had the license to write I you know I really wanted to include it um and so with the fourth book and the uh, and the Crown Jewels, I thought, well, where better to come and come and see you guys, obviously at the Museum of London, and find and find out, just kind of flesh out the ideas I had a little bit more um, about about the animal Crown Jewels, about the Crown Jewels, about um, what medieval London really looked like, because I wanted to st start it there. The legend starts in in the, I would be right in thinking that's medieval London, wouldn't I? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so what for sure. even, what, what, uh, good, because because that that appears in the book. So I'm glad. I got it. <laughs> no, you were you were you were bang on. That was really good. <laughs> what uh, what medieval London looked like, and and the feel of it, and and then I sort of I I, I went out and I you know I sort of acknowledged them all in in the book at the end. Your good selves at the museum, um, Peter, who's the chief warden at the. the or yeoman, I think, at the at the Tower of London, because I, I had a lovely tour there, um, because obviously the, the, the animal crown jewels are kept there just as our crown jewels are. And and then I, this lovely guide who I've started uh, going on walking tours with, um, Simon uh, Whitehouse, who, who, who's a blue plaque guide. So he took me around uh, Hampstead. So I got a, a good idea up there because I, I wanted to base the start of the book on uh, overlooking medieval London. And um, and obviously, even now, Hampstead's one of the highest points in London, but back then you can only imagine the great view you would have had of, of the old medieval St Paul's from, from Hampstead. Um, well, I was interested that, I was really pleased that you you put St Paul's Cathedral in the book and there's a lovely illustration of it looking in its, its medieval splendor. So I yeah. thought I'd just thought, talk a bit about uh, the medieval St Paul's model that you look when you came to visit the museum um, and because there's actually been a cathedral of two St Paul since 604 so for well over a thousand years. So this would have been this version of St Paul's is is what is what what era is what age is that is that is that the, the second or third incarnation of it or something? St Paul's burnt down shortly before that version was built. So they started building that version of St Paul's, the medieval version, in 1087. And it took them over 200 years to build it. Once they'd finished, it was like the biggest building in England. And the spire was over 120 feet high. And so you can see that really clearly in that lovely illustration, how dominating it would have been on the landscape. Um, but one of the things I quite like about St Paul's is that it wasn't just a religious building for people to go and worship. They, people also held business meetings in there and they played games inside. And some boys really got into trouble they threw stones at pigeons and they got thrown out of the church as punishment because they had broken some windows. So there was all sorts of life going on in, in the cathedral around the, the religious services that were, that were held there. I also wanted to say that big spire that you see on the medieval version of St Paul's, that's a few, you know, after uh, the medieval period, um, that gets struck by lightning and it burns, the spire burns down. So um, the rest of the cathedral su survives and the tower does in the centre, but the, the tall spire, it, it disappears. And did they ever, they never rebuilt that, no? They didn't, no, no. And then 
then in 1666, you have the Great Fire of London, and then the whole cathedral is destroyed, and then they have to rebuild it. So Christopher Wren then designs and builds, or, for, or, or starts building, the, 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 the St Paul's as we know it now. Yeah. It doesn't disappoint, that's the thing. Yeah, it's great. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, you have some very important guest stars in Toto's world for this, this new book. We've got the mayor of London, Dick Whittington, and his cat, Tom, um, which obviously they're, they're massive legends for London. So um, what made you decide to feature them in the book? Well, I love a prologue and I love, um, I love a legend. And I thought, and, and then, so then I just thought, well, the animals need a legend too. And I didn't have to search too far to find the most iconic uh, animal in London history, really. Um, so it was always, you know, as soon as I, I sort of found Tom, also that it's, it perfectly suits the story because you have a world where animals and humans kind of coexist in, in, two, different, in two different kind of um, uh, worlds really within, within, within London. So, you know, it, so it's lovely that they also happen. I, could, I was able to write it. So it also happened in medieval London. So, but what, but I sort of added the fact that, um, the crown jewels is a, so the, the way I've written it is the crown jewels are, uh, are, are a cat's collar and they are, um, or in many ways a rat's collar and they're broken in uh, Tom, Tom doesn't want them to, to fall into the wrong hands. So he breaks them in two. One band is sapphires and the other is diamonds. One band gets put in the Tower of London and the other band he hides, uh, never to be found, he thinks. Uh, so therefore, um, because they have magical qualities when they're put together and he doesn't want um, any of that power to fall into the wrong hands. We have quite a few objects relating to the legend of Dick Whittington in our collection. So we've got books, we've got prints showing him and his cat in Hampstead and we also have this tiny little coin um, that has Dick Whittington and his cat on it and it was probably made by the owner of a shop um, that had the sign of Dick Whittington and his cat on the outside so they wanted to remind people where they where they worked so they made these little coins that people could use to buy things. The Dick Whittington from the pantomime is like this, this poor boy from the countryside who comes to London to, to make his fortune. And um, he lives in this rat infested house and he gets a cat. Um, and then his um, owner, or sorry, his master, father, Dick Whittington's master, um, has to send a ship to trade with a far off nation. And everybody in the household gets to send something in that ship to sell and Dick has um, nothing. He doesn't own anything apart from his cat. So he sends his cat over. And it just so happens that the, he get the ruler of the country, the, this far off country, his palace is infested with rats and Dick's cat goes in and kills them all. And, and he, the ruler is absolutely delighted and sends this big amount of money back on, on the ship. So Dick is able to make his fortune and, and marry his master's daughter, Alice, and, and um, then eventually become Lord Mayor of London. Does the um, cat come back? Pardon? Does the cat come back in, the, in, in that episode? Or does the cat just always stay away? Quite sad. That's a really good question. I'm not actually sure. <laughs> I'd be quite sad to, to, you know, the idea of me giving up my cats would be awful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but the, the real story is sort of, well, it's, there's elements of truth in, in, in the legend. So there, there was a Richard Whittington. He was born in 1350 in Gloucestershire. So he is kind of out from the countryside, um, but he wasn't poor. His um, father was Sir William Whittington, who's Lord of the Manor. So he um, Dick would have been brought up in a fairly wealthy household, but he's the younger son. So he has to travel to London to, to get a job. So he becomes an apprentice mercer. So that's where you learn a trade for seven years when you're an apprentice. Um, so I've got some couple of objects from the museum collection that are sort of relevant. Um, so imagining Richard or Dick traveling from Gloucestershire to London, he would have had to carry some water with him to drink on the way. And uh, the 
medieval equivalent of a plastic water bottle is a leather one. And this is one we've got on display in our medieval gallery. And then, yeah, so he becomes a really successful mercer, actually. Um, he ends up supplying the kings, two kings, Richard II, Henry IV, with lots of luxurious fabrics like silks and velvets. Um, and he loans them money and things like that. So he's a really important guy. And he does actually marry a girl called Alice Fitzwarren, but she's not the daughter of his master. Um, and he he doesn't when he dies he doesn't have anyone to leave his money to um he dies in 1423 so he leaves all his money to charity and they as you said they do loads of amazing things with his money so they built um this huge set of public toilets it's the largest one in london and it's got it's called uh, Whittington's Longhouse, and it's got 64 toilet seats for men and 64 toilet seats for women. We don't have anything in the museum collection from Dick Whittington's original Longhouse with its 64 seats for men and 64 seats for women, but we do have a three-seater medieval toilet, um, which you can see here. So you can see it, it's a, a plank of wood with three holes in. So you could have had a very communal toilet uh, session if you wanted to back in medieval times. But it's right next to the river, so the river sort of washes the toilets yeah. out twice a day when the tide goes out. Well at the time um, as well that would have been, I mean the amount of sort of waterborne diseases I'd say would have been huge. So that's that's a, that was a, a, an incredibly uh, valuable asset for the city I'd say now. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Especially when times when sort of toilet facilities are not that great, you know, to have this huge public loo is, is brilliant. And he sets up a library, he gives money to two hospitals, he sets up houses for poor people to live in. So yeah, he, he did a huge amount for the city. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, and one thing that's slightly different from the legend of Dick Whittington, because in the, the legend, he sort of, he leaves London and then um, bow bells, the church bells appear, that like they're singing to him saying, turn again to Whittington, thrice mayor of London, go back to the city. Um, and, but actually he was four times mayor of London, technically speaking. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> um, so I wondered if you wanted to, uh, read that bit from the prologue. Yeah. The prologue. yeah. yeah. So this, the, the lovely thing about the prologue, and I, I love a prologue, the lovely thing about a prologue is that you can properly, you set the scene of your book, but also you can, what I love doing is completely taking it in a different time. And, and in fact, with the new book I've done, a new book set in Scotland, and I've done, um, it's not, there's no sort of historical reference there, but I love a different scene that you set the whole scene and then you can kind of kick off with chapter one. So, so this is the prologue. Uh, this is before Toto and Silver and um, Socks and their friend and their friend Catface, who I'll talk about later, I'm sure, um, before they even start with the action. So, <clears throat> it was gone midnight when Mayor Dick Whittington, riding a giant horse with his trusty cat companion Tom tucked inside his coat, finally arrived at his destination, the top of Hampstead Heath, the highest point in the whole of medieval London. Overlooking the capital, they could make out St Paul's Cathedral, standing proudly, the beacon for all Londoners, its tall spire jut jutting up into the cold, clear night sky. For a while, it said nothing, content to take in the view of the city that helped to build and keep safe. With a quiet purr, Tom finally emerged from his master's coat, climbed out and stretched, arching his back. He then nuzzled at Dick's neck before jumping down effortlessly from the horse onto the mossy grass below. Both Dick and Tom were exhausted, but this task had to be completed in secret under the cover of darkness. This was partly due to their fame. In late medieval London, everyone knew the mayor of London and his cat. But it was also due to the importance and power of what Tom carried with him. Are you sure about this, Tom? Dick whispered as loudly as he dared, afraid of being overheard. You won it fair and square by defeating an evil that would have plagued the city, maybe even the whole country. King, King, King Roderick, the absolutely filthy dirty, is beaten. His rat army have fled thanks to you. And now with this mysterious magical collar, you're the most powerful animal in the world. 
because of the strength it gives you, no one can best you in combat. Most incredibly, you can speak in my tongue. Don't you think I know that, my dear friend? The cat, the wise cat replied. That's all the more reason to do what I do tonight. I can't risk this collar falling into dangerous hands. The animal world is safe for now. But should this collar be found by the wrong cat or rat or dog? Well, come, join me. It's time. His master dismounted and dug out a small silver box from the horse's saddlebag. He carried it over to Tom and they stood together at the side of a pond. The human smiled at his companion. I'll miss our chats, Tom. Oh, don't worry, Dick. I'll still understand you, but now I just won't have to answer back. I can act like a regular cat and ignore you. Dick laughed and ruffled Tom's fur. Well, if you're sure this is the right thing to do, rest assured I'll honour your agreement. Half will go to the Tower of London and half will be lost for all time. The cat nodded and pawed at the collar. It unclasped and came apart in two perfect circles, one of flawless diamonds and one of deep blue sapphires shining in the moonlight. No matter how many times they saw it, both human and cat found its beauty staggering. Taking one last look, Tom placed the diamond band into a velvet pouch and carefully popped it back into the silver box, snapping it shut. He threw it into the deep inky pond. They watched it slowly sink to the bottom, eventually disappearing from sight. The two friends smiled at each other, although Tom felt sad he'd never get to speak in human tongue again. He knew it was a small price to pay. He jumped into the warmth of his master's coat and they mounted the horse and st started to ride back to London to their cosy beds. Tom was certain that with his enemies beaten, all the animals of old London town and indeed the world would be safe. And so they were for the next 600 years. <laughs> Until... Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. I, just, I get such a buzz, right? Really, it. it's great. Yeah. And now I bet everyone will be like, oh, what's going to happen next? <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, well, the Dick Whittington in your book is, is based on a real person. Um, Toto and Silver in the book are based on real cats, aren't they? It's their lives. They are. I mean, there's no based on this. This is what the stuff they get up to on a, on a daily basis. So Toto and Silver are based on, on uh, real cats. Like I said, Toto, we, we, we adopted them in Italy about eight years ago, around kind of Easter time. We were out in Italy. We've got a little house in Puglia, right in the hill. And it's in the middle of nowhere. So um, it's kind of countryside, all, but near the sea, but countryside all around it. And um, it's farmyard country, so there's lots of olive groves and uh, and there's no real, there's kind of stone walls, but there's no kind of, uh, there's nothing to keep animals in or out. So there's a lot of cats, there's a lot of rats. And cats are kind of, there's a lot of wild cats down there, but they're very, um, not by everyone, but they're kind of revered because they keep the wild, they keep the, you know, the rodents at bay and so forth. And so we had this cat called Plaxi, who was um, just hanging around the villa. And we started feeding her because she was really friendly. And, uh, and we got to know her really well. And then I was coming back a day, she was pregnant. And then while I was coming back a day early, I think for work and my wife um, FaceTimed me or Skyped me at the time the next day and just said, um, she's having her kittens in my pillowcase. <laughs> Wow. Oh, so my wife Dee just stayed up with her and just helped her deliver these kittens. Every time she went to go to bed or go out of the door, like she would start meowing. So she'd come back with water and stuff in the bowl. And she was essentially just a cat midwife. And um, and we were going to get a dog that year. And that was the moment. We just thought, well, that's serendipity. So our friends over there looked after them and got them with their injections and so forth. And then when they were about 13, 14 weeks, I think they flew them back here. And then they've been with us ever since. But but Toto, we realised when she got here was was about ninety five percent blind. We could we realised she was sort of bumping into stuff, and then we realised she could see breaks in light, but she couldn't. It was, I think the, the way the vet described it is there's there's a camera uh, there's a camera in the eye, but there's no film. Mm -hmm. But it's not. A, I mean, it's a big deal when you're a cat, but it's not. It's not. It doesn't end the game, you know. You, you cats have got these, you know, great other senses they rely on through smell and their whiskers and their and their hearing and so forth. So she has a great life. And and then we, after Silver passed away, we um, stupidly thought she needed company. 
uh, which she doesn't at all. She's perfectly happy being on her own. So we decided to adopt a, um, a cat from Battersea and we end up with this psychopath from um, Battersea, eight weeks old, <laughs> who's even now three and a half years down the line, does an absolute nut job, but he's great. We love him. He's, he's who, who, you know, jumps on her all the time and makes her life a misery. But they actually can get on quite well sometimes, so called Socks. So we have two cats now, uh, Toto and Socks, who they're brilliant. I mean, you've got cats, you understand. It's, it's great. And I think they're, they're such a great London pet as well because they, um, uh, the, you know, they're a city pet, really. And don't get me wrong, I'd love, I'd love a dog and I'll hopefully get a dog one day. But um, if you're busy, I think it's, it's great to have a cat. Yeah, yeah, because they are so self-sufficient. And, but when they do come up to hug you and give you, like, attention, you get so happy. <laughs> exactly. It's funny, isn't it? I think cats are... Cats are, I think people that don't have cats always think they're quite aloof and they're not friendly. And those things can be true, but they are, I find cats to be really sociable and really friendly and actually properly part of the family. They're just not as needy as dogs. There's something lovely about how needy dogs are, but, but there's, what I love about a cat is a cat can come into the room and go, and I've learned quite a lot about cats since I started doing this. I mean, you know, our, our vet wrote a book about them ages ago, which I sort of studied before we got ours. Um, and I was weirdly, I was doing a, a thing like this for the Cat Protection League the other day, and, and I was being interviewed by a vet, and uh, and we were talking about it that if a cat comes and sits next to you and looks that way, that's the ultimate sign of trust. So a lot of people that aren't cat people, um, cats like them because they because they ignore them. So they think, oh, okay, if you're ignoring me, it means I know you're not a threat, so I'll go and sit next to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it works. Oh, lovely. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, cats have sort of been living with humans for as long as London has been around. So, you know, over 2000 years. Um, but our, I think our relationship with them has changed quite a bit, which is something similar to what you were talking about, about um, how cats in Italy perhaps are used a lot for pest control. Yeah. And they were certainly used like that in London for, you know, hundreds of years for catching rice and rice I mean mice <laughs> um, to stop them eating you know things they shouldn't um, and we've got loads of cat related objects in the museum collection and we also have some cats themselves um, so I thought I would just show you two cats from our collection yes um, so the first one is a pest controller cat and it's it's quite unusual it's a mummified cat and a rat that were found um, behind some bottles in an old warehouse in, in the 1890s. And we think what happened was the cat was chasing the rat behind these bottles and they both got stuck and they sort of mummified in position, um, which is pretty horrible for the animals concerned. Um, but, you know, we have this amazing evidence of, of how cats were the, the pest controllers of these big dockside warehouses, um, some of which you, you kind of mentioned earlier, those, those old Dickensian mm. warehouses. Um, and then the second cat I wanted to show you is probably one of my favorite items in our collection. And um, it's a cat called Oliver. And he's a stuffed black cat and he sits underneath a glass dome in one of our stores and he's in this cupboard which has a glass door and every time I go in that store I always go and look at him because I love him so much and um, he's a, a kind of example of how cats gradually over time become much more like the treasured pets that we have today and Oliver belonged to a lady called Alice from Charlton and he was obviously so beloved. Um, she had him at the end of the 1800s that when he died, she had him stuffed and, and, and kept. And he's sort of holding on to this little bouquet of flowers. And we don't quite know what the bouquet is, um, but he's a big cat. He's a right bruiser. And he's got one long fang sticking out of his mouth that you can <laughs> see. He's just brilliant. And uh, <laughs> Um, he was the star of an exhibition we had a couple of years ago called Beasts of London. That's um, great. Um, as well as cats in your Toto series of books, um, lots of other animals feature. Then you, you've got this whole kind of animal kingdom in London that you, yeah. you feature in, in the, the Mystery Jewel Thief. So I have a quiz that I was going to ask you. 
it's the beasts of london quiz and you you can other people can do it on our website if you like and that we'll put a link on our facebook page so this um, is what sort of beast i would be within london specifically exactly yes so it's a quick fire quiz so i'm going to ask you some questions they give you an instant reaction instant instant reaction okay. we'll find right. out what beast of london you are it's exciting so if you were to go on holiday do you go to Italy, China, USA, Morocco, or the Suffolk countryside? Italy. So, Italy, right. Uh, if you fancy a snack, what do you eat? Would you have an apple, some sushi, bowl of nuts, a juicy steak, or anything lying around? Anything lying around. Okay. Uh, if you had a superpower, what would it be? Would it be lightning fast speed, invisibility, incredible strength, super sharp vision, or an amazing ability to sleep? Oh, it would be, uh, what's the first one? Lightning fast speed. Lightning fast speed, yeah. Okay. Um, so how would you like to travel? Would you travel on a horse? by sailing ship, by flying an aeroplane, by being carried or by walking? Uh, on the ship. On the ship. Okay, and if you're, lo you're lost in the woods far from home, where do you sleep? Under a nice bush, in a burrow, in a proper shelter, in a tree house or anywhere? Uh, the bush, I think. Okay. And then you have found a time machine. Who do you go back to meet? Do you go back to meet Julius Caesar, Roman commander, Joan of Arc, French heroine, Sir Isaac Newton, genius scientist, King Henry VIII, or would you rather stay here? Oh, no, I would probably... Oh, either Isaac Newton or Henry VIII, I think. I'd probably go Henry VIII. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so you're on a cruise ship, but it's sinking. What do you do? Do you panic or stay calm and make a plan or bash your way out or relax? You fancy to swim anyway or wait your turn to evacuate? I think I stay calm and make a plan. I hope I stay calm and make a plan. Okay. And then final question. Your friends say the nicest thing about you is you're always there for them, or you're totally honest and fair, or you're great fun to be around, or you come up with brilliant ideas, or you don't smell that bad. <laughs> um, I think, well, I'd like to think it's a combination of always there for them and then fun to be around. Oh, you gotta pick one. I know. Let's say I'm always there for them. I mean, okay. you try and be as a friend, don't you? Oh, it's calculating. What are you going to be? You are. Oh, you're the gentle dormouse. What? <laughs> I like a gentle dormouse. I'll take that. But I prefer the cat. Oh, absolutely. I think cats, domestic cats in a nice household have the best life. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Well, um, Dem, I'd just like to give you a huge thank you for everybody at the Museum of London for taking part in the event today. Um, Pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. Well, you're always welcome to come back to the Museum of London. Well, do you know what? I'd love to because I, I, we, you were so kind to give me the tour and obviously we looked at the medieval side of it, but um, like the, so you could spend the whole day in one section, which is what I love. You know, the, the kind of the, the Edwardian and then the, going up to the Second World War period that was fascinating. So I, I want to come and see a lot, a lot more of that. Oh, cool. Yeah, well, fingers crossed, you know, if the, the whole lockdown easing happens yeah. the way we plan it, then we should be open soon. So yeah. that would be my main thing. Brilliant. All right. And thank you so much for sharing your new book, Toto, The Ninja Cat and the Mystery Jewel Thief. And um, thank you to everybody at home for watching us. Thank you, Dermot. Thanks, Mariel. Thank you to everybody at home for watching today. We really hope you enjoyed it. 
Um, for even more Toto content and resources from the Museum of London collections, please visit museumoflondon.org.uk and there you can visit our online shop to purchase your very own copy of Toto the Ninja Cat and the Mystery Jewel Thief, plus a limited edition signed print if you order before Sunday the 11th of April. So thanks again for joining us. Bye bye. Thank you.